this is Eric Evian, uh, moderator for the, desi or the design mechanism uh, question and answer panel. Um, again, we have Lawrence Whitaker, and we also have Pete Nash, and we are going to be talking about the design mechanism, uh, RuneQuest 6, and any other questions that uh, you may have. So feel free to ask any questions you have. I'll be updating this link uh, through the Oxymule channel. So feel free to answer or ask any questions. And uh, Lawrence and Pete, feel free to answer any of those questions. We can start with one question I have. I typed up here. What is RuneQuest 6 and why would I want to buy the, that? Uh, it's a great, great question to kick off the panel as well, David. Thank you very much. And uh, hello, everybody. Uh, hello, David. Hello, Richard. Hello, anyone else that's. Uh, and uh, please excuse any snarls you hear in the background. I've got a, a, a pack of rabbit tigers that I use for gaming inspiration. <laughs> very nice. Yeah. Uh, they decided to kick off. I'd, I'd point the camera at them, but it probably disturbed the bandwidth. Is that what you um, the, what is, the, uh, D20, the D20 fans, the D&D &D fans? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what, what is RuneQuest 6? Well, it, it's the latest incarnation of one of the, the oldest role-playing games that, that's out there. Uh, RuneQuest started life, I think, 38 years ago. Uh, with Chaos, it was one of the the first three big role playing systems, and it differed from Dungeons and Dragons in that it wasn't based on classes or levels. Um, it had a distinctly ancient world feel. It was designed to support the Glorantha setting that uh, Greg Stafford created. You know, nearly fifty years, sixty years ago now. So uh, it's been around for a long time. And um, RuneQuest has been through several different incarnations. Um, Avalon Hill have the third edition of the game. Um, good game system, but uh, support really kind of petered out. Then Mongoose picked up the license for it uh, around 2006. And Pete and I came on board uh, while Mongoose had that license. We were working for the company because we had a lot of experience with it. We became kind of the de facto line editors. We updated the system from Mongoose's first version or first stab at RuneQuest, which wasn't very well received and had a lot of issues, and we produced uh, what was branded as somewhat confusingly RuneQuest 2. Uh, a lot of the stuff that you find in RuneQuest 6 is based on the work that Pete and I started there. We rebuilt the system, we took a, a very different approach to things such as magic and combat, cults, um, character creation, and although we were pleased with what happened with Mongoose RuneQuest 2, there were certain constraints that limited what we were able to do with the game. So when the license fell from Mongoose's hands and became uh, really up for someone else to take it on, we, we took that opportunity. And so RuneQuest 6 is the game that we wanted to produce. It's a natural evolution of all the concepts that you find in Chaosium's RuneQuest and to a certain extent in Avalon Hill's version of the game. We've added uh, some new elements for 21st century gamers. We've integrated some kind of metagamey concepts like passions and uh, a few other things, but essentially it's the same game. Percentile based, skills driven, uh, very much about character and story rather than killing things, experience points, and taking their loot. And uh, we're really pleased with where the game's at. It's, it's out, it's been getting some very, very good press. And why should you buy it? Well, first of all, it, it helps Pete and I keep the game alive, um, but also it's a very, very good game system in and of itself. Um, lots of people have said that they feel it's the best incarnation of RuneQuest yet, and it's, it, it's always difficult to, to sound modest about this, but that's what other people are saying. So I think it indicates that we have done a lot right, and I think if you want to get into RuneQuest now, this is the best time to do it. RQ6 will will give you everything you need. It's a complete book, and RQ really has never been a complete book in itself before. It's always been supported by various supplements that you had to have. We've tried to change that. So with the Request 6 rules, you've got everything there. Magic, monsters, combat, mayhem, equipment, the lot. It's all there. So one book does it all. If I, if I buy that one book, I don't need anything else then? Can you just go with it? Yes. Certainly. <clears throat> That's a good thing, because I guess one thing I heard, I heard that what is it sixty dollars for the book? It's a rather expensive book, but if it's at just sixty dollars, but that gives me does that have scenarios in that as well, or is that do I still need the scenarios? 
There's no scenarios in the book itself, but we do provide two free to download scenarios on the website in uh, our Dungeon Masters pack, which also includes uh, free copies of all the tables included in the book as well. So it's very easy to make your own Dungeon Master screens and the like. So lots of handouts, plus two free scenarios, and we hope to actually increase that number as well in the future and we hope that uh, other people will write scenarios which they will want to host on our site too yes I absolutely as Pete says okay so you are accepting basically maybe not a specifically freelance uh, writing or writer submissions for those adventure scenarios and is that kind of along the lines of basically just a fan-generated uh, content database you're speaking in regards to as far as submitting uh, those scenarios? There are two ways that we can run this. Uh, the first is for writers to approach us directly with material that they would like design mechanism to, to produce. And uh, I've had three or four authors already submit proposals that I've been evaluating. Now, we, we won't publish everything that comes our way, we will vet it because clearly we, we want to make sure that the quality and the atmosphere and the standard of writing meets the, the, the goals of the brand. So that's the first thing. You're not guaranteed to have something accepted. Um, if you do have a scenario accepted by us, then what we will do based on the nature and the length is decide whether or not we're going to add it into a book that we might be publishing, whether we're going to host it as a free to download thing from the website, or whether we'll charge a little bit of money for it, a couple of dollars. And a, a lot of that really does depend on, on how big it is and how much effort we have to put into getting the thing ready for a wider audience. Um, that's one avenue. The second avenue is what we call the RuneQuest Gateway License, and that is not an OGL-based thing, but it's not that far from it. Um, if we have external producers that want to produce their own material for sale in print form or on PDF via drive through or something like that, um, approach us. Tell us what it is that you're thinking of doing, um, as long as it meets our approval and we can see a sample. We will give you the rights to use the, the RuneQuest Gateway logo, which is really saying um, officially supported for RuneQuest 6th edition and uh, has the permission of the authors. And th there's no cost for that license. We don't take any money from it. So third-party publishers can produce their own material, sell it, hopefully make some money from it. Nothing kicks back to us, but it helps advance the brand. Okay, that is actually, that's really interesting. Um, do you see that actually uh, uh, allowing for more writers to produce uh, content uh, for your company as far as third-party support? Um, that is giving them authorization to continue making material. Um, is there any other restrictions on that, or is it basically um, as soon as they approach you um, and you give them the approval, they have free roam to... Uh, create whatever they wish to like. There, there are certain restraints uh, built into the license and they're all really common sense. We, we don't want anything that would bring design mechanism, RuneQuest and Isseris who, who hold the license, we, we have a license from them, into any kind of disrepute. So, no, we, there, are, there are certain things that we wouldn't want to see being published and we won't discuss those here but you can kind of imagine the sorts of things that we, we'd want to avoid. You know, we, we don't want RQ fatal going out there, all right? So <laughs> that's, that's probably the first thing. That, that would definitely be a big no-no. Um, the second restriction <laughs> is you have to submit it through just for general approval. Um, there is always the chance that someone could come up with a brilliant idea that replicates something we are going to be doing just down the line. And yeah. obviously we don't want to, to have our direct sales injured, but nor do we want something we're doing to injure a third-party product, so we could work out a compromise there. Um, the third thing is no Glorantha. Um, people can't go out and produce Gloranthan supplements using the RuneQuest gateway. Uh, Glorantha is handled under a completely separate license. It has a very, very different procedure, and so that is actually uh, forbidden directly. It's the only thing that's forbidden directly under the gateway license, but otherwise, talk to us. And you know, I've had a couple of people approach me, one with a really, really cool idea that I've never seen done in a role-playing setting before. Lots of potential, ideal for the gateway license, and I'm looking forward to seeing that move forward. Okay, sounds good. Um, I currently do have a question from uh, Richard Balsley. 
Um, is this related to legend, or is it something entirely different? <laughs> you legend, okay, legend is the degloranthorized uh, version of the RuneQuest, Mongoose RuneQuest 2 rules, which Loz and I wrote. Um, RuneQuest 6 is the next step evolved from Mongoose RuneQuest 2. It basically incorporates all the stuff that we didn't have an opportunity to include in RuneQuest 2 because we were constrained by page count um, and also by backwards compatibility with the previous version of the game. So we've not only expanded the material that uh, Legend is a is the short concise version shall we say of RuneQuest 6. It is the bare bones frame of the system. RuneQuest 6 just takes it a dozen steps further, and so gives you a huge amount of Sorry, are, are they compatible? Legend and RuneQuest six. Are they com compatible? If somebody has Legend and one, somebody has RuneQuest six, can they uh, work together with that? Yeah, ninety-five. Yeah, ninety-five percent. <clears throat> it's almost uh, hardly any work at all to convert the two, or use the two together. What about the older books like um, MRQ two? Is that still compatible, or is that getting a little bit more difficult? Well, as I said, Legend, in effect, is Mongoose Ringquest 2. It just has the serial numbers filed off. So if I have the MRQ book, I have Legend then. If I have, have, if I have MRQ, I have Legend then. MRQ yeah. 2, you have Legend. Because when Mongoose lost the license for RuneQuest, they were left with a very good game system that they wanted to continue to produce material for, but of course they weren't allowed to mention the word RuneQuest and they weren't allowed to incorporate any Gloranthan material in it at all. So they sent it out, had all of those references removed, uh, but the the actual underlying rule system is identical. And um, you, you know, David, it's not just the old uh, Mongoose RuneQuest books that you can use with RuneQuest 6. Anything that's been developed for a D100 system across the past 30 or 40 years, you can use with RQ6 as well. So you use all my um, There's a huge. Cool. Like, yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, the, the, there are differences between the various incarnations of, uh, of RuneQuest and basic role playing systems, but at the heart, they work the same way. And the the degree of compatibility is extremely high. You do have to do a little bit of work, but uh, if you wanted to use an old Stormbringer scenario with RuneQuest six, it's not going to be an issue. If you want to use Call of Cthulhu, not an issue. Some differences in skill names, but it's so easy to work it out. You really don't need to do any work. You can handle the bulk of it on the fly. Well, I've I've run first edition D and D adventures under third edition D and D, and that's a huge change there. But mainly, main concern is like the what the what you need what you need to have at the at at the table. If if say I have a friend who has Legend and I have Mongoose Room Quest Two, and somebody else has Room Quest Six, we can create characters, and the characters well. I guess the main thing is the character creation is the important thing. As long as the characters, I mean, people aren't really checking the the, NP the NPCs don't really need stats. You know, the DM can just run those on the fly. But uh, yeah, absolutely. But the character, the character, the PCs, the player characters have to be compatible, and they will be. Yeah. Okay. Um, a current question that I have in general is: uh, RuneQuest Six is out. Um, is there any other uh, products that uh, the design or the design mechanism is working on currently, or are you uh, solely focusing on uh, RuneQuest Six currently? Uh, do you mean uh, products for RuneQuest 6 or something completely different, different game systems? Um, other different uh, game systems you may have, or are you so, uh, focusing uh, specifically on RuneQuest 6 at the moment? No, we're focusing solely on, on RuneQuest. Um, it's important to develop the brand recognition. Um, it's important for us to, to get this game to a point where we can sustain the company before we can then start thinking about other games. Um, whether we will or not, I honestly don't know whether we'd start producing material for Savage Worlds or, or Pathfinder. I, I, I really don't know what to say. But part of me says probably not. We will continue to focus on, on RuneQuest. It's, uh, it's our love. It's why we set the company up. Um, 
that's where we want to focus our attentions. You know, if we become suddenly a, a, a mega successful and we've got a hundred employees, uh, then we can take it. <laughs> At the moment, it's two hours. We've got our hands full just with RQ. Oh, definitely understandable. Okay, um, I have another question uh, from Richard Balsley. Um, I'm wondering how much of a shift there is between the mechanics in regards to the new version and uh, how much uh, conversion work there would be. Um, we kind of did answer some of these, but it looks uh, mainly a question in regards of uh, perhaps specific mechanics that might have changed from edition to edition. Or mainly how much math one would have to do. How much math? Um, very little. There's, some of the skills have been slightly renamed. Um, in effect, the, the magic systems are all still very similar. Um, still work with fundamentally the same ways. Uh, I think most of the attributes that are created from the characteristics are the same. Mm. I think there's just some refinements and things like the combat special effects, which, you know, after a couple of years of playtesting, or rather a couple of years of actively being used, uh, there were some mechanical flaws or mechanical um, exploits that people were finding in Mongoose Ring Quest 2 Stroke Legend. And so we've refined those slightly. Same with some of the spells as well. Uh, but when it comes to actual mechanistic number changes, uh, there's hardly any, I don't think. Okay, sounds good there. Um, I do have another question uh, from David. Uh, what sorts of scenarios are you looking for as far as uh, third-party support? Good ones? <laughs> yeah, yeah, good good ones. And, uh, we, we're very open-minded. If someone comes to us with a steampunk scenario, brilliant. If someone comes to us with you know a, a sword and sandals or sword and sorcery themed thing, again, excellent. It's the quality of the writing, the originality of the material that is what we'll be looking at first and foremost. Um, obviously, we want it to we we want to do as little work as possible. So we want to make sure that all the, all the rules are are incorporated in the right way. We do have a set of writers' guidelines that we can send out for people that are thinking of writing for us. But really, it's it's down to your own imagination. Where we're not saying we want everything to be uh, this kind of fantasy or that kind of fantasy. Come to us with something and uh, and let's see what you've got. If it's really good, we can take it for anything you can possibly imagine. Basically, um, if you go to our uh, website, we have a, a free download of uh, firearm rules for RuneQuest. Now, RuneQuest 6 is primarily written for um, sword and sorcery. I mean, we had to have some kind of uh, genre flavor built into the core rulebook. But the firearm rules are there just to show you that if you want to write modern scenarios or science fiction scenarios or science fantasy scenarios, you can go for it. Um, there's support there built in straight away. So is there a chance that they do come up with something in the modern world that you might actually be interested in buying it then, or just as a hypothetical? But Yeah, certainly, uh, providing it's good. Um, uh, if you take the writer's guidelines and you follow them... Uh, of course, everything you do is good, excellent. <laughs> um, of course, well, of course. That's the yeah. trouble. You know, you see, sometimes you get some submissions which... <clears throat> uh, less good than others. Um, but yes, um, we really are in the market for anything you can possibly imagine. Now, do you have plans to do different settings? Like I know Mongo did all those different settings for Rubus. Are you planning to do that too with different you know, settings? That, you know? the, the whole idea behind uh, the way we've set up RuneQuest is that RuneQuest itself is a standalone game system. So if you've got the book, you can pretty much run anything you can possibly imagine, at least in the sword and sorcery genre. And you should be able to tweak the rules to fit whatever you want. Um, what we're producing now are <clears throat> either scenario compilations or 
one-off setting books. So whether it be a sandbox setting or a historical setting. And they will be just, you know, isolated things. I'm not sure we're quite thinking of the idea of producing a long line of books supporting one particular setting in the sort of mongoose style. So if you say you did a one-off setting, let's just say, sake of, uh, you know, RuneQuest Oriental as a one-off setting, and then I go, and that be a, might be a good opportunity to write an adventure based on that and then try to sell it to you then? Yes, yes, yes. that would work. I mean, we, we've got two history. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Yeah, um. we, we have Mythic Greece and Mythic Britain, which uh, Mythic Greece is... Okay, it does appear we have uh, some lag from uh, Lawrence right now. I'm hoping he's still there. Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, sounds good. I was kind of worried there. Now, what settings are you thinking of doing? You mentioned Mythic Greece and Mythic Britain. Um, yeah. Anything else in the plan setting books that you're planning in the future? Or are planning to plan? Or might think about planning? Well, the next two things that are coming out are uh, the Book of Quests, which Loz spoke about earlier today, which is a sequence of seven sword and generic sword and sorcery scenarios, which you should be able to fit into any fantasy campaign with ease. And the other one is Monster Island, which is a sandbox setting um, of what it says, basically, uh, an island full of mysterious creatures which turn up on these islands, uh, sorry, on the island and rampage about the place, and some very strange and wacky cultures which are um, trying to survive with one another, and the player characters get thrown into the middle of it. <clears throat> so those will be the next two products we produce. Um, the Mythic series will be next year. Uh, there's another book which Lois will talk about uh, based on a, a graphic novel. Uh, we have a, a guy called Mike O'Brien whose old time rune questers will recognize who is uh, wanting to write a mythic Constantinople setting book. And there will be a specific Glorantha setting book as well. I don't think we revealed the details about what it is yet, but it will be a fully comprehensive um, return to Glorantha fully supported by RuneQuest rules. So, so we have quite a large range of things on the conveyor belt. Just to come back and answer uh, David's question, Books, where would we entertain scenarios written for that that book, such as? Uh oh. The answer is absolutely. It's good. Okay. Um, I do have another question from Richard here. Um, now seeing that we do have uh, more material that's going to be uh, produced by the. Uh, design mechanism for RuneQuest 6. Um, the question posed earlier was uh, for RuneQuest 6, are you going to be working on a overarching story for a core campaign or are you focusing primarily on the rules uh, through the company and then adventures settings for uh, freelancers? Um, it does seem you do have uh, material already in the pipe for uh, further releases as far as specific settings go. Uh, yes, yes, we do. We're, we're not going to try and work on an, an overarching and I, I don't really think that that is something that the market is always looking for. Be the easiest kind of thing to to produce on a regular basis, and uh, really, it's. Greece and uh, Mythic Britain supported by die scenario packs and really on 
writers. I've coordinated the project. We set up um, a, a background different scenarios, but it's all by individual writers that we are now coordinating and we will publish. Structured their classic scenario packs. They were all done by outside people. Um, we'll do all the settings and freelancers do all the scenarios. We'd like it to continue to be Okay, okay. Um, currently, I do have a question uh, from David. Um, suppose somebody was thinking of buying either RuneQuest, uh, Pathfinder, or Savage Worlds uh, to run a fantasy setting. Um, basically, any uh, current competitor that RuneQuest might have. Um, what would be your elevator pitch to argue in favor of buying RuneQuest over the others? <laughs> we have the best combat system. <laughs> It's the oldest, it's the best of all those three. It's the longest library. That system. Unfortunately, we lost half of that, but never mind. <laughs> um, yes, uh, RuneQuest is a, a system that very quickly fades into the background. You don't need to keep on looking things up for it. Um, it scales well. Any combat is dangerous. And the way our combat system is structured, it becomes very dynamic in the fights. It's not just a, a hit point attrition system. There are lots of fun things you can actually do. And the the description and the story of the combat actually writes itself without you having to actually put any brain power into it at all, apart from choosing what kind of weird and wacky options you want to to use. I guess I can tell you two things I, that usually gets me choosing RuneQuest is one, your character has to worry about dying no matter who he is. D&D, &D, sometimes he doesn't have to really worry if you put a gun to his head, he can just laugh about it. And yeah. the other is it seems to be more flexible with magic that you can put in any magic system you want. The Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, you're tied into the Vancean system. Um, Savage Worlds, you're tied into their their PowerPoint system. RuneQuest, they have the, the Rune system, but, but it seems like you can just take, you know, I mean, it seems easier to just put in whatever, however you think magic should work and put that into it. Those seem to be the two big advantages of just I see. Magic especially is very easy to uh, deal with. We offer five different types of magic in the RuneQuest call rules. Um, a good animism system, um, a mysticism system, which is kind of Wuxia uh, style, uh, key focus kind of effects. There's classic sorcery and classic divine magic as well. But uh, if you look at the type of things that Roz and I have written over the last three, four years, you'll notice that a lot of the different settings we've written for, we've created brand new magic systems for. Because that's always been the biggest problem with all role-playing games, is that trying to model a particular fantasy book or fantasy series style of magic with an off-the-shelf D&D or Savage World magic system is quite difficult. It takes a lot of work. Whereas with RuneQuest, it's quite easy to just rip out the entire magic system, toss it to one side, and come up with what else, you know your own version on how you think things should work. So if you look at some of the older thing, uh, the historical setting books I've written, things like BRP Rome or the Viking system, you'll notice I've got magic systems which accurately represent how people thought about magic from those periods, which aren't flashbang in any way, shape, or form but do try to represent what that culture thought of magic at the time. And for RuneQuest, it's easy. You just you know, So if somebody came along with RuneQuest 6 and said, mm, I quite liked the Viking city and magic from Mongoose RuneQuest Vikings, they can just pluck it straight out of there and plug it straight into RuneQuest 6 without any effort at all. All right, I'm 
actually really, really liking the sound of that um, already. Um, I actually do have another question from Richard here. Um, how are skills handled? Do they have their own mechanic, or do they use the same as uh, the combat rules? If the latter, how does the system make it feel like you are, or make it not feel like you are attacking a problem rather than solving it? And the, the the answer is that skills and combat generally they're applied. Uh, combat skills are on a second by second basis for but the way that you apply that resolution is handled very different skill a mundane is something for you. Um, so there is a distinction there. Combat and mundane We also have an opposed skill resolution system for that. And um, mundane skills can be uh, in very different ways. So we differentiate quite clearly between combat and something. And I think that the the way that skills play more worked in basic role. Unfortunately we lost at least half of that lot. Yes, my. Um, to extrapolate what Lodz was saying, um, combat skills are treated on a seconds-by-second second basis, so therefore um, they are viewed in a slightly different way. And because combat is quite a, a large part and parcel of role-playing games, you do spend uh, put a different degree of focus on them. Uh, whereas mundane skill use, whereas it being influencing people or hiding from people, are treated in a slightly different way. All of those skills are handled using effectively the same skill mechanics. So a straight roll against it if you are just sort of effectively challenging yourself or trying to achieve something, or if you are actively um, using your skill against somebody else who's resisting you, then it's an opposed skill challenge. And that mechanic is pretty much universally used across the board for nearly all the skills. There's a few little bits and pieces of special reality things, so for example chariot driving or whatever, you'll get a, a little bit more detail about that specific event, but on the whole the actual use of them and the mechanics of using them are universal. You don't have to worry about um, mini games or mini specific rule sets for a particular skill. <clears throat> now, how does it handle skills above 100? If you've got a character like a vampire or an immortal who has a you know, skill higher than 100%, you know, much higher than 100%, um, how are you handling that nowadays? Um, what you do is you take the amount that over 100% of the highest person in the contest and you apply that as a penalty to everybody in the contest. Now for those who have difficulties with mental arithmetic we have a, a little side rule there saying you just round up to the nearest 10. So for example if I have a, a combat skill of 133 and Lars has a skill of 87 we'll just say 33 rounded up 40. I'll take 40% from my, my uh, well, I'll take the 33 from my skill, or 40% from my skill, knock me down to just around 100, and I'll do the same thing to Loz's skill, so he gets knocked down to 47%. And because of the, um, the statistical probabilities there, it means that that gives me a huge advantage. I'm so probably going to... With 210, and you're not at least 100, you're pretty much uh, screwed. 
Yes. But you yeah. probably should be. If you're going up against a vampire with 210 and you've only got 87, you're probably, yeah, you probably should not be doing that. <laughs> yeah. It's not completely impossible. There's still always that tiny base 5% chance just for fun. Um, but in general, that's the way it's handled. And the way the skill improvement system works, uh, actually gaining skills over 100% takes quite a while to get up to and so it's not so much of an issue as it used to be especially from games like Stormbringer where everybody started off with 150% or 200% with their demon weapons if you remember those good old days so you could split your attacks everywhere. Um, I once calculated a formula to try to guide with with Immortals how, how many how, how high their highest skills should be. Yeah. Can't remember but, the, uh, was a cool one. <laughs> But that solves the, the issue of skills over 100%, and it solves it quite neatly. And once you don't have to worry about single digits, it, um, it's not really an obstacle to play. Sounds good. Um, currently, I do have a question coming in from Richard, um, though I'm just going to pose a general question about uh, the, the, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the design mechanism itself. Don't know why I'm having a hard time saying design today. It's been kind of a rough one. Um, but as far as it goes, uh, when did the company start uh, in comparison to uh, the Avalon Hill days or um, the Mongoose run? Um, when did uh, the design mechanism start, and when did you start uh, working on the uh, RuneQuest 6 material? Uh, we formed in, I think it was May... Last year. Um, we got May. May last year. Oh, okay, yeah. there we go. Um, Chaosium started in what, 77, 78? Um, Avalon Hill took it over in the early 80s or mid 80s. I believe. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. And then you did start on the Rune Quest material as soon as you opened. Okay. There we go. Um, I do have another question coming from Richard. Uh, do you have a learning curve built into the skill system so that the costs increase over a certain percentage? Are there multiple breaks or just one? The learning curve uh, works like this. Um, at the end of the scenario you get a number of experience points, experience rolls, um, usually around three, and you can choose what skills to apply those to. Then what you do is you roll against that skill on a d100 and if you roll equal or higher to the skill it increases by 1d4 plus 1%. If you fail to roll equal or over the skill, it goes up by 1%. So you improve slowly, even if, uh, but towards the end, it gets more and more difficult to get a, a decent improvement. And what we've noticed from long-term play tests and many campaigns is that because we limit the number of experience roles offered people tend to um, assign those experience roles into areas of their weakness rather than trust trying to become superhuman at uh, combat skills and you no longer need you know a very high combat skill to be competent in combat either the combat system is being overhauled and tweaked in such a way that it's actually there's a lot of very cool stuff you can do without having a, a stupid high skill in it because it's all dependent on the success level of your roles so if you roll a critical or a success and your opponent rolled a failure you get a special effect happening whereas in previous incarnations of RuneQuest you used to have to take a penalty against your skill value to be able to put off these kind of tricks or stunts or feats or whatever you like to call them in modern 
uh, role-playing game parlance. So in the old days, if you wanted to specifically attack a location, you'd take a minus 40% or half your skill, depending on the version. Uh, nowadays, that kind of just happens as a natural organic part of your rolling. So people don't feel the urge or necessity to actually just throw all of their improvements into things like combat. And so uh, characters grow very organically and very nicely. Does that answer his question? No, it's, it's now, is this like a, an option? Like, suppose you want your players that, that they need the high combat skills and they take on these, you know, vampires and stuff. Say you're running a vampire slayer campaign. I mean, is there ways to say can control whether you want a campaign which is more muted in, in you know, limited superhuman, sort of, uh, one where the characters are encouraged to become superhuman? There's plenty of ways of doing it. You could um, tweak the the culture package when you're creating your character. So you just get, say, if you wanted to be a, a Buffy vampire slayer in a, a Buffy the Buffy campaign, well, you just give them like plus fifty percent to their combat skill as a you know just part of their culture package. Or if they become vampire hunter, give them another plus fifty percent in the skill there as well. And so they can start off with being very highly skilled if they wish. Or you could increase the amount your skill roll uh, gives you if you succeed. So instead of a D4 plus 1, you could tweak that, make it, say, a D10 or a tweak 20 if you wish. Or you could even just off the bat say, OK, at the end of the scenario, everybody gets three experience rolls, but everybody automatically goes up 10% in their combat skill. There are plenty of ways to, to handle it. Uh, I think we give a little bit of GM's advice about that somewhere in the book towards the end. Um, but you certainly shouldn't feel limited by the rules as written. We very emphatically state throughout the book, please house rule this game as much as you want to make it fit what you need it to do. It's, you know, your game will vary. And so we, we try to encourage people to tweak it, to make it run as they need it to run. Sounds good. Sounds killed. And let's see, uh, general comment, uh, the random roll is a really cool way to do that. Um, I see so many ways to use that limit, uh, or to limit people to realistic results. As a designer, that makes me happy. Yeah, it just naturally kicks in over time. <clears throat> I mean, that's always been a part of RuneQuest in general. But in the old days, it used to be that any skill you successfully used when you were gaming, you got a chance to roll to improve. Nowadays, um, we tend to... We, we don't do that in RuneQuest 6. We found that um, it used to, in the old days, lead to some skill abuses. You had the golf bag full of weapon guys who would pull out every single weapon in sequence and make an attack with so that they get an increase in all of their weapon skills. Um, so uh, limiting the number of experience roles sort of focuses people more on how to improve their characters. Okay. Um, I do also have another question. Um, characters who have totals above 100% only get 1% uh, experience, I take it. Yes, in general. Okay. There we go. Um, I do have another question coming in from uh, David in the chat here. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, so I, 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 can say, I, I can speak if you're looking for another question here. Suppose... All right, let's, let's say I'm saying planning a campaign where characters, part of it is different characters have different advantages. You know, one guy might have the, you know, special medical training, which is not only that he's good at medicine, but he can do things that untrained people can't. Another guy might have, you know, certain, you know, maybe uh, from the fairy world, he can uh, do certain, you know, tricks, you know, three times a day. What's the best way to handle that in RuneQuest with, with characters with advantages and disadvantages? Ooh. I suppose it depends on how you want to set up your your setting, really. I guess one um, one, one thing like like maybe you know poured in like a system like in GURPS or other games where you get advantages and disadvantages, you spend character points on them, or would it be better to maybe try to mimic that with skills that you have like maybe a you know 
specializations or skills like that. Like you get a, a, a you know, you can do it in specialization skill or something. You can do it in uh, both ways, actually. Um, for example, in the uh, Monday night game I play in here, we have. Uh, I live in the north of Sweden. If uh, people didn't know. Uh, we have a bunch of Swedes who uh, like homegrown Swedish settings. And one of the famous Swedish games is called Mutant. And Mutant is effectively the uh, Swedish equivalent of Gamma World, where hell, you know, the world has gone to hell in a handbasket, and there's all kinds of weird mutated animals and psychics and things trundling about the place, but with a very Swedish feel to it. However, they like my... Uh, uh, they like running and playing with RuneQuest 6. So what they did was the GM said, right, we're going to use RuneQuest 6, but we want all the, f the fun mutant powers. So what we did was we all rolled up our characters, we all designed them. Um, some of us you know, went for technological skills and robotic skills. Um, in RuneQuest, you have sort of common skills that anybody can do. So climbing, sorry, running and jumping is athletics, hiding is stealth, that kind of thing. And then you also have professional skills of things that you only learn by, you know, actually studying and training. And so a whole bunch of us went for all these kind of specialistic uh, technological skills. Um, and a few others went for mutated animal types. And they went back to the mutant book and they rolled up some random mutant powers. And so we just plug them straight into the rules. OK, you've got fire breathing. Uh, we'll call it um, a combat style. There you go. You can use it as your unarmed skill, and it will do 3d6 damage when you breathe on people three times a day. So, so if, I wanted a was, with, sorry, if I wanted a character with x-ray vision, I could create an x-ray vision skill and uh, use it to see if I can uh, x-ray things correctly? Yeah, simple as that. So, OK, you have a new skill, X-ray vision. Put it down in your character sheet. Start off with, say, int times 2 plus 30%. There you go. Simple as that. Um, OK, that's an easy way to make some skills. <clears throat> I mean, it's, uh, how, do you, how do you hack your normal, your normal favorite game of choice? You know yeah. Now, speaking of int times skill, in, in times two, etc. Starting your 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 default values. I like remember that from MRQ, you know, Mongoose RuneQuest. And I'm thinking, okay, if I, I create say a character, say he's a Vulcan, you know, and has 32 intelligence, and he wants to play poker. He originally starts out with 64 percent. We're still still doing it that way. That that having a really high starting set will get you get you a really good head start on any skills. Yes. Uh, all skills have... After that, then once once you learn the skill, does having a high stat give you any other advantages? Once you picked up a point of poker and you're at a Vulcan with uh, say sixty seven percent poker because you're so intelligent, does your high intelligence give you any advantages after that? High intelligence will actually add a bonus to your role when you're in rolling to improve your skill. Um, so if you remember earlier, I said you roll equal or greater than your skill value where you can actually use intelligence as a bonus to that role. So very highly intelligent people actually learn things quicker. So if you're a Vulcan, you can pick your poker. You can very quickly move poker up to a really, really high value then because it just clean out all normal pe the normal people then, right? Yes. We've tried to balance all of the characteristics so they all have a roughly equivalent um, bonus for the attributes that are based upon them. Of course, some are still slightly better than others. Um, well, I have a good NPC to promote a game sometime. <laughs> yeah. And of course, RuneQuest is the, the game where every creature has the same stats. So if you uh, wanted so to play an alien race or a monster or whatever, you can do. I asked uh, earlier, have we used uh, RuneQuest to play in science fiction settings? And the Hang in there, Lawrence. Oh, God. Is it still slow? Yeah. Okay. Um, I ran a lot of demo RuneQuest 6 games, not using RuneQuest Sword and Sorcery scenarios, but actually using it to run Star Wars. 
And so I have um, my own house rules for a Star Wars hack that we briefly posted. Um, so I actually use RuneQuest to run Star Wars games. And I use the, the mysticism magic system for running force sensitive characters. And everything else was, you know, tied into the firearm rules and a few extra skills, new skills for uh, science based subject. And then created a, a bunch of uh, characteristic ranges for the iconic Star Wars uh, races. So, um, yes, we can we can use it to run science fiction games very easily. Okay, um, I do have a word here that Lawrence is uh, typing about uh, talking about the culture game. Um, yeah. <laughs> also replies, uh, David, we don't look to uh, balance abilities per se. Uh, some simply are better than others. So if you have to say a uh, fantasy setting and your elves are just naturally better than your uh, humans and you just uh, don't let people play elves or just uh, say I guess that's a... Uh... It's up to you. Are you a GM who has prima donna players or are you a GM who just goes hey we can have some fun with having a mix mishmash party? Um, some people it's a, a game breaker, some people love it. I remember talking once about a Highlander game, and my comment was, "Well, you know, either everybody had to be the Highlander character, or nobody was Highlander character, or you know, just leave for the NPC to be either the NPC was Highlander character, or everybody had to be Highlander character because your Highlander would be so much better than everybody else." <laughs> it it really does depend on your GM style. I, I have seen games and played in games where there has been a, a disproportion in the. I don't know, ability level or power level of certain characters, but has been balanced out by the social constraints and the cultural constraints of the game world we've been playing in. Um, in other times, I have seen games where somebody's playing a centaur and somebody's playing a duck, and you know, a good typical Glorantha game, and there's no balance there whatsoever. I mean, the centaur is just a, a combat monster and the duck is near useless. But it's all, it's worked because it's fun and off the wall and entertaining. And so it, you have to find those kind of strengths. But it, what it comes back down to is the fact that in RuneQuest, we do not try to enforce balance between races and species. If you want to play a game where you have different races, then go for it. I mean, you probably have the same sort of situation in a Star Wars game. So a Wookiee is just horrific if you're looking at it from a, a characteristics point of view compared to a normal human. You so might try to. Yeah, I mean, like you might say, certain certain ones are available and certain ones are not. You know, I know, you know that that you could be an elf or a dwarf because they're roughly human scale, but you can't be a, uh, you know, can't be a minotaur because they're just way too powerful or something. If it was going to be a problem for you, then yes, that's the best way of going about it. The way we give all the um, examples in the RuneQuest book itself is uh, we kind of firmly made it humanocentric in the character generation chapters but later on we do introduce the uh, the idea that certain species can be used as player characters and we do give some guidance about how to use different species as player characters later on in the book too GM section I think where it may be the creature section I suppose I'm playing a, a science fiction game and the players want to create their own races how easy is that should be very easy. It's Generally, just a of, does the GM to trust the player to come up with their own stats and not create a total munchkin uh, race? <laughs> Depends on your players, doesn't it? Um, the structure of creating a, uh, different races is again we have guidance for it within the RuneQuest rules. So um, come up with a reasonable range of characteristics which fit the creature. And then the actual culture and profession, you can pretty much use uh, the same rules. So you get X hundred percentage points to put into these 
skill sets and X hundred percentage points from your profession to put into this these skills, plus a little bit more bonus to tweak your character as you want it. And there you go, Bob's your uncle. So generally players or characters will start off with roughly the same amount of skills. <clears throat> oh, sorry, same amount in their skills. Um, so just because you're playing a, a, a winged gorilla instead of a human, it shouldn't make that much of a difference. Okay, sounds good, sounds good. Um, it is looking like it is almost uh, time for our panel, unfortunately. Um, I would like to ask if there's any uh, final questions from any of our audience members that I'd be able to pose. And after that, we will be uh, wrapping up here for the next panel. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Looks like I have a late typer. <laughs> Oh, I, I, suppose could, I suppose if you have a little bit of time, I could ask about some sort of setting rules. If I wanted to give this uh, anime feel versus a Bollywood feel versus a realistic feel, how that would work. If, you know, if I wanted to say run an anime game, how would I give it an anime feel? Uh, okay, well, we haven't actually included support for that in the core rules per se. What I had been hoping to do was uh, produce a series of articles free to download from our website, which would give examples of how to play different types of genres with RuneQuest 6. Um, the Star Wars one was supposed to be a, a first of a series, <clears throat> but of course um, it's a bit of a, a, a minefield intelle uh, prop in intellectual property-wise. Um, so. I will get back to that in the future and I give found, well, I, some... Yeah. I found most systems it, it turns into just saying this is anime all the time you're supposed to feel that this is anime. Only one system I feel actually seemed to have captured the anime feel in the rules where you actually felt like you were actually in the anime universe as opposed to just saying you were in the anime universe. <laughs> well, I will be writing a series of how to do hacks uh, sequence. Uh, which will be posted up on our website later. It's just a matter of rewriting things to make them more sort of um, generic so we don't uh, fall foul of anybody's copyright issues. So that's another advantage of RuneQuest, and it's, it's more hackable than the other systems. Like Savage Worlds, they want you to stick to the Savage Worlds mechanics, and I'm kind of a Savage Worlds heretic, so he's adding things. That are <laughs> RuneQuest is the, the original completely hackable game system. It's it's so easy to hack it about. Um, very easy to make changes. It's easy to swap in and swap out skills. It's easy to swap in, swap out magic systems or just re um, reskin them to use another sort of computing term to to use uh, to work as you want. Um, dead simple. If you can find a, a copy of my Star Wars hack sort of lying around the internet somewhere, then um, that should give you a very good set of guidelines of how to hack things for a science fiction game. I guess I see um, reskinning as being like the opposite of hacking. Like in fourth edition, you know, you can theoretically just take your fighter and call him a psionicist and just, you know, change all the names and everything, everything works the same, but you've just like given a new paint job, whereas... RuneQuest is like you're putting in a whole new, you know, it works differently. I mean, the core mechanics is just going to be work the same, whatever the genre is. I mean, we all fight effectively the same, we all fire guns effectively the same, and we all sort of interact socially the same. So all of that doesn't need to change. It's, you know, what skills you have, uh, what gadgets you have, what superpowers, if any, you have. And those are just plug and play. Well, I suppose this brings me to me another one, if, if, we, if we still have time, is that when I was considering doing Iron Kingdoms and RuneQuest, one thing I was thinking is, okay, now you're damaged, now suddenly it becomes very important. You know, in D&D, &D, uh, Steam Jack hits you. If you're a high-level fighter, that's okay. If you're RuneQuest, a Steam Jack hits you, you're basically dead. So how would you, I mean, it's if you wanted to make a character who could, I mean, you know, you know could get hit by Steam Jacks and, and live to tell about it, I mean, you know, is there... 
Uh, it depends on how you, you conceive combat in d d Is is those hit points you've lost the actual luck points or evading it by the skin of your teeth? Or is it literally that you are superhuman and you can take that kind of brutal punishment? With RuneQuest, of course, it's more realistic. You can't take that kind of brutal punishment. Uh, you could maybe survive with a luck point or so, but um, the way you should probably tweak it or change it is the fact that your high level fighter has actually got 40 or 50 percent more skill than the steam jack and so therefore it's quite easy for him to escape by the skin of his teeth all the blows that the thing is throwing at him well that works well they just not just not get hit so i figure you just max everybody's dodge out so they don't get in the, hit in the first place and, and make sure to tell them don't get hit by steam jacks <laughs> don't get hit by steam jacks but and that's of a, course, then you're changing the story that you're, you're you know in the one story the guy is you know fighting off the steam jack and the other one the guy is uh basically taking the precautions not to get <laughs> yeah. you know, i mean that's the thing about room you have now. you have active parries and things also, you know, um, you can uh, it models armor differently. So armor does actually reduce damage of things that hit you. So providing your steam jack isn't so totally yeah. over the I top. Think, I think you could sort of survive a, a fight with a steam jack if you were good. You had high skills and especially high dodge. You could probably survive a fight with a steam jack. It's just your your mechanics are so different. You're you're, you're doing something different. Or another example was a, a you know D and D a high level barbarian charging into zombies, and you're in high level D and D. They're basically terrain and rune quest. You charge into zombies now. It's like you can maybe maybe survive. I don't know. I mean, if you have some sort of legendary skill to survive that, but you're you know you're not going to just. It's not going to be just like their terrain to you. They're no. <laughs> All fights are potentially deadly. Now you don't have to finish fights off in a deadly manner. You can finish fights off uh, by disarming people, laying them out on the ground, or forcing them to surrender because you're so awesomely good. But you do have to be careful if you're going to go out there and go for blood, there is a chance that something bad happens to you. Luck points for player characters does sort of mitigate it. It's not as bad as RuneQuest 2 day, the original RuneQuest 2 days, where people would lose limbs left, right, and center. Nowadays, you're, uh, you're a bit more rugged and survivable. But you do have to be careful. Just like in real life. Okay. Sounds good. Um, I do have uh, two questions here dictated, and that's going to be about all the time we have left. Um, currently, there was a question posed by uh, Lewis in this uh, Google Hangout asking, does RuneQuest use a uh, wound system or hit points? Uh, Lawrence replied, hit points, but wound levels also determine what effects you suffer, uh, which can vary from limb loss to other things. Um, the last question Lewis posed was also, do hit points scale with level? Or is it something like uh, steampunk, I think, in parentheses, that stays the same? Uh, Lawrence replied to that, um, no, there are no levels. Hit points are determined on uh, constitution and don't increase. Um, with that said, it is uh, just about time to wrap up here. Um, so I'm going to have to thank uh, Pete here, who... You have done a great job, and I've learned a lot about RuneQuest uh, more so than I came in, and I'm actually really kind of considering that just listening to it. It's always something I wanted to dabble in, but I've been kind of tried and true uh, D and D guy. But I'm actually kind of considering switching after hearing about RuneQuest. Oh, give it a couple of sessions. It's always worth yeah. trying everything once. Exactly. So it's actually on my uh, list to do here. And also, thank you, Lawrence, for uh, coming in today. And uh, even with the audio issues, it was great having you here. Well, thank you very much for having us. Indeed. And thank you. And I'm sure Ross is saying the same. Yep. Indeed. All right. Um, in a few moments here, we are going to have uh, the Funny Side of RPGs panel. And this is going to be hosted by Stan! Exclamation point. Um, we'll have that one up in just a few moments here, uh, live via the uh, Oxen Mule stream or chat room on the AetherCon, and also the YouTube stream via this uh, Google Hangout. Um, we'll be seeing you in a few moments, and uh, you guys both enjoy the rest of your AetherCon. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good night, everyone.